Are you ready? See you, Brad. It's time for another episode of Fireside Chat. Another NHL season is in the books. 82 games down, and the Calgary Flames are not going to be playing postseason hockey, so it's time to book their tea times and enjoy a summer off. As usual, I'm Dan alongside Matt for another episode of Fireside Chat, which is brought to you by Tick Ticks. Tick Ticks connects the Sea of Red to buy and sell tickets securely from their phones. Download Tick Ticks in the Google Play Store or the iOS App Store. Matt, how are you feeling right now about how the season is has ended? Well, at least if you're going to miss the playoffs, at least the Flames finished with the fifth worst record. So at least they're not it didn't finish like one point out of a playoff spot and then they're not going to get somebody decent in the draft the worst that the flames can pick is seventh if everything or eighth if the if everything goes wrong in the draft lottery so you know there's enough good players in the draft where the flames will be walking away with somebody good just and, and the lowest and they can pick is one. It's not likely, but they can be. They can get the first overall pick. Yeah, uh, there's a, about a ten percent chance of getting either first, second, or third each. So. And with Edmonton being in the draw, we probably won't get it, knowing their luck. Yeah, personally, I'm hoping for second, just so we can get Patrick Lene and have a Ovechkin type slap shot on our team, so Gaudreau can just feed him the one timers. That'd be good, though. I think, I don't know, I'd almost rather have the first overall pick if you're going to go that way. Then you have options. You could draft whoever you want. You could trade down. It just gives you more options. True enough. Plus, then we can say that we beat Edmonton for the pick, which is always nice. Yeah. And plus, from a marketing perspective, it would be good for Calgary to have something to balance against Edmonton's litany of first overall picks. And their new arena. True. True. Well, let's talk about the week that was, the final three games of the season. Uh, the first game, the Flames took on the Los Angeles Kings, and this was a 5-4 overtime final. And, Matt, anything to say about this besides the game you expected from the Flames? Well, I thought that the Flames were going to have a difficult time like they did in the last game last week against the Kings. And they managed to put four in the net, so they didn't come out on top. They couldn't hold on to the lead, and Monaghan ha- made a boneheaded mistake at the opposing blue line in overtime. But what can you do? It- it's a team that's likely going to win the Stanley Cup, in my opinion, so... They did well enough to at least force it to overtime, now we just have to see how the Kings do in the postseason. When I was watching this game, I thought it was actually, I mean, it's the Flames played the way I sort of expected them to play, um, which was, you know, I, th- I thought after the Edmonton game, they'd come out and they'd play pretty hard. But I thought this was a fun game to watch because there was a lot of momentum shifts. There wasn't one team that took a whole period of momentum. There wasn't one team that, you know, was dominating the other. It was pretty much a back-and-forth game the whole time, which... I found fun to watch. Yeah, well, nobody had more than a one-goal lead at any point in the game. No. Which is odd when you have a 5-4 score. Yeah, it is. And, I mean, if we look at the scores, too, there's a lot of personal milestones in this and a lot of, you know, goals from unlikely places. We had the first goal of the game was Backlund's 18th, assisted by Colborne in England. The second Flames goal in the second period was Hunter Shinkarik's second, uh, assisted by Giordano and Goudreau. Uh, Calgary's third goal was Mark Giordano's 21st, assisted by Goudreau and Monaghan. And our fourth unlikely source was Derek England's second of the year, assisted by Furland and Colborne. So, you know, we're seeing players, I mean, I guess Backlund's the guy who's been scoring a lot, but good to see Shinkarik and England stepping up and getting some goals late in the season. Yeah, well, especially Shinkarik getting his first goal in Calgary, his first game in the Saddle Dome. Yeah, I'm this sure is, his parents were thrilled. This is becoming quite the story for him. You know, the Calgary boy, he got drafted by Vancouver. He was so excited when he got traded back to the Flames, the team that he says he, he cheered for growing up. 
and now we're seeing him, you know, playing in Calgary and getting a goal. And it's a great story that we've got going on there. Yeah, hopefully he impressed enough that he can fight for a spot next year on the opening day roster. Not sure if he'll attain one right off the bat, but he did well enough in the short stint at the end of the season to put him in a good light anyway. One of the things I think helped the Flames in this game, which was very different than what we saw in the Edmonton game, was they stayed out of the penalty box. They only had three penalties the whole game. And I think that helped them keep the score pretty even against L.A. Because I was sort of expecting them to get frustrated and give L.A. a bunch of power plays, and that would put L.A. higher on the scoreboard than they were. Yeah, I can agree with that. And you have to be impressed with the bruising forward Johnny Gaudreau running the goaltenders in consecutive games. Yeah, it's I don't know what's got into Goudreau. Yeah. A little bit reckless there. Yeah, it did seem like it, didn't it? You know, he's got to learn to control himself and, you know, not unleash the beast so much. It's nice to see, <laughs> though. I mean, it's not something that we're usually seeing from him. No. And I think, and tell me if you disagree with this, I think a lot of the reason why the Flames were able to get four goals in is that Jonas Enroth was in net. I think if Jonathan Quick was in net, based on the quality of shots that I saw, we probably would not have got four goals. Yeah, I probably one or zero. Yeah, I'm thinking one, maybe two, based on what I what I saw there. But yeah, I think Enroth gave us a chance in this one. Yeah, especially that backland goal. Uh, that one. That one would have been saved by Quick. Yeah, that whole situation was a bit of a mess. But you take what you can get. Oh yeah, of course. And then the second game of the week, we took on our arch rivals, the Vancouver Canucks, and uh, uh, this is a fun game. The Flames, just like the Edmonton game, it was nice to see a blowout where we blew out our uh, big rivals. We had got the 7-3 win over the Canucks, and this was a, a fun first game. Um, lots of shots. If you look, the Flames averaged about a shot a minute in the first period. And I don't know about you, but I thought Derek Grant played a heck of a first period. He seemed to be all over during that period. Yeah. I'm curious to see what they do with Derek Grant because he's a very excellent face-off guy and that's one of the things that the Flames have lacked for years. And if the Flames can move Matt Stajan either to the wing or to another team, I think that would be a net benefit for the team, especially with the penalty kill because if you're losing draws consistently right off the hop then it just makes killing a penalty that little bit more difficult right off the start yeah i don't i don't know about Derek grant i mean i think that they will bring him back for sure um i think that he'll probably be in the nhl but i just don't know that you're going to be able to move stagen's contract and i'm not sure i'd move stage in the wing i could see them as much as they probably don't want to if they can't move the contract, place them on waivers. See what see if anyone bites. That's a possibility. And even if you have to assign him to Stockton next year like they did with Mason Raymond, it's well, not the ideal situation, but that might end up being what needs to be done. But, I mean, Stage is known as being a good guy in the room and a great leader, and I think that could actually be a benefit to send him to Stockton because I could see him throwing a C on Stage and and really making him that veteran leadership guy down there. Yeah. The only it, downside to send him to Stockton then is he, depending on how long he's down there, his contract would be ineligible for the uh, expansion draft as far as the 25%. It is? If, I, but, well, because isn't it if you send him down there, you got to... I guess you could still keep him unprotected. You just have to then protect or... Well, he, it, he it has changes a, the balance of contracts with the 25%. Yeah. He could still be exposed, but it would just change the balance of money. Yeah. Right? Because what were they saying? You got you to gotta protect at least 25% of your salary? Yeah. Which I guess wouldn't be that bad anyways, because we got some big contracts. That shouldn't matter either way. True. Actually, I'm thinking that he may even be a candidate for a buyout this year, possibly. I don't know. I don't know. In a big contract year where I think we're going to be close to the cap, I'm not sure I'd want to carry that buyout 
for for a couple more years. Yeah, there would be a four year commitment. Well, well, that's it. And looking at where we're gonna be after we sign Goudreau Monahan, I think that'd be a bad idea. I don't I don't want to carry that money for four years. I think he'll. I think he would be great to expose in an expansion draft, and I could see him starting the year in the AHL and earn his way back up. It just depends on the performances of the other players in the organization. Like if guys like say Jankowski, uh, Poirier, Klimchuk, they all tear the cover off the puck at, at the training camp and that you're gonna need to make room and there's only so many spots so it'll yeah. largely depend on the the play of the younger players but there you know going back to Derek grant as a player though he was a good pickup in the offseason you usually see them pick up these guys that they're just marginal veteran ahlers and when we picked up grant i didn't know a lot about him i didn't expect a lot about him so he's one of these guys that exceeded every expectation i had for him Oh, same here. I knew he played for Ottawa, and that was about it. But, I mean, Ottawa's organization isn't really a deep organization either. No. Like, that's why when he came here, it's like, okay, well, I guess, uh, you know, it's a veteran AHL guy only. Yeah. Because if you're not good enough to make Ottawa, then, you know, how good are you? But good on him for having his best professional season. And hopefully he can continue and get re-signed and play next year for the Flames. We should note also in this game that Michael Backlund got his 19th, 20th, and 21st goal of the season to give him a hat trick. And I believe this is his first hat trick of his career, isn't it? Yeah. And, you know, I'm sure he was happy to do it against Vancouver because he's not very fussed on them. And a couple other interesting notes. Um... Drew Shore, after this game now, I believe, no longer has waiver eligibility. He didn't last year either. Oh, didn't he? Okay, so he's up for good now. If we want to send him down, we we would have to have him clear waivers. Yeah, we exposed him to waivers earlier oh, this did? year. That's right. I forgot about that. Yeah. So, yeah, he could still go back down then because he played less than, what, 10 games or 30 days in the roster. Well, we would have to re-expose him to waivers. Do you? Because don't you get 10 games for free? Oh, no, no. Oh, for next year, yeah. My oh, mistake. Yeah, no, but I'm saying he could still go back down to Stockton for a, a playoff push this year. I do believe he already has been. I think so. And another player that I was really surprised by was Joel Colborn. He looked fantastic in this game. And I think, for me, this was probably, for a guy who's looking for a contract, this was probably Colborn's best performance of the season. And if he could have played like this all year... I think it really could have changed the Flames' fortunes in a big way. Well, you have to compliment him. He's come on really strong in the last, well, pretty much since January. So if he can continue to play like that and even get a little stronger in the off season, then he should be able to develop into that quality second, third line forward that the Flames were hoping he would. But we just have to wait and see. Unfortunately, you can't really tell if this was just a career year or just the start of a, some good things to come. Do you think it's almost too little too late for Colborne? I mean, he's looking good, but the team was already out by the time he started looking good. Is this a guy, as a GM, you'd hire to, I guess, hire in re-signing, but that you'd bring back next year to, you know, play the same way he is and expect this kind of play all year well uh, or is he just a guy for who looks me, good I'm when it ex- doesn't matter like if I'm re-signing him I'm expecting the 28 to 35 point Colborn not the 44 point guy like it would be great if you're you get a 45 or 50 point season from him but if you're walking in with that expectation, you're more likely going to be setting yourself up for disappointment. Like, just like with Backlund scoring 21 goals, I do believe he only had 16 or some or 6, I mean, at the All-Star break. And he scored like 15 and was one of the top scorers in the second half. 
Well, if you're expecting him to score 20 goals again next year, that's being a little unrealistic. He could. It's just you can't set your expectations of, okay, Backlund's now a 45-50 point player. Colborn's a 45-50 point player. Because that's how you end up getting a season like this year where we were expecting guys like Stajan, Jones, Juris, Boma to be quality third and fourth line players and they all pretty much failed at their job. 2013-2014 Colborne had 80 games 10 goals 18 assists for exactly 28 points 2014-2015 he played 64 games got 8 goals and 20 assists for 28 points this year's a career year for him at the NHL level. I actually think it's a, a career year since he's been a pro at any level, actually. Um, 73 games, 19 goals, and 25 assists for 44 points. And, you know, I totally agree with you. I think you signed him to a 28, kind of that 20 to 30 point player money. You don't say that this guy's a 40 point guy. And if he turns out to be, then it's a great value. And, you know what, I'm happy to re sign him in two years or whatever. And give him that kind of money. But he has not proven to us that this is what he is. He's proven to us for two seasons that he's a 28-point guy, so pay him as such. Yeah. Well, also, you also have to be leery of the player playing on a bad team getting a lot of points trap. And both Colborne and Backlund, if the Flames were a more stacked offensive roster I do not believe that either of them would have got the power play time that they did and they might not have scored more than 30 35 points if the Flames had a quality second line so you have to weigh that in the situation as well and to me, I think if you're negotiating with Colborne and his agents want the you know 30 to 40 or 40 to 50 point money, this is a guy that as much as I don't really want to, I would walk away from. It would be difficult, but under that situation, I would sign him to a one-year deal. Like, a, here's three and a half million for one year. If you prove it again, then I'll extend you like another three, four years at three and a half. And if you struggle, then we'll figure out like a two, three year, two and a half million dollar contract or something like that after. But it, it'd be tough. I would imagine that situation. If his people are looking for that 40 point money, the Flames would say no. We'd go to July 1st. He'd field some offers, one of which would be ours. That's how I'd see that scenario play out. Yeah, well, he's still an RFA. So. Oh, right. That's right. So, yeah, no, you're right. Then you retain him on one year. Um, see, I thought he was UFA, but no, you're right. He's RFA. So yeah, you retain you retain the rights. You pay him, like you said, do a one year deal, and make him prove it. And if he does great, you know, then I'm willing to pay him three point five. But yeah, I don't want to sign him long term, assuming forty four points. No, because that's how you get into bad contract territory and. There's only so much cap that you can use. Well, we even saw some of that with the Boma deal this year, too. Yeah. A um, couple of the notes I had for this game. I thought it was really good that the Flames' PK was 4 for 5 on this game. It's a special team that we've seen struggle, so I thought it was really good that the pa- penalty kill was able to to go 4 for 5. But is that? I'm also debating, is that a Flames' strength, or is it just Vancouver falling apart? Like, watching this game, I realized the Canucks are in trouble. Oh, yeah. The Canucks are probably in a worse position than the Oilers were when they started their rebuild in earnest the year that they got Taylor Hall. And, like, unless they can deal off the Sedins for a decent package, which I don't know of any team that could afford both, uh, yeah, it's going to be tough. Vancouver, they don't have much of a developmental system they have very few prospects and they have a really crappy team so uh, honestly i don't see them making the playoffs in the next five six seven eight years either and it's going to take them a long long time to sort out all the problems in the organization vancouver 
in their position to me reminds me of the Flames prior to the Jerome McGinley trade. I think they've built sort of by building pieces around the Sedins, just as we kind of build pieces around Jerome. But it's time to make a wholesale change. We only had to move one player, which was Jerome. They have to move two. But I think they're at that sort of denial stage of, well, we don't need a rebuild. Do you remember the Flames for a while said, we're not rebuilding, we're retooling. We're not rebuilding, we're doing whatever other marketing term they wanted. And I think Vancouver's been in that spot for a while. And they just need to bite the bullet and make the deal f- to move the Sedins and start again from there. Now, here's a question for you. If Vancouver was willing to eat half and the Flames were able to throw a guy like Dennis Weidman their way, would you acquire the Sedins? No. Okay. Right. So the Sedins right now are 35 years old, $7 million each for three more years. So we'd have to pay them, what, four and a half, but let's say three and a half by that logic. We do exactly half. Yeah, so seven between them. Yeah, so so we'd essentially be paying one scene and we get one free. It'd be a buy one, get one free deal. Because they're making yeah. seven million each. We pay one of them, we get the other one free. If I'm looking at where they would go on this roster, my worry would be who's going to get displaced for two 35-year-olds and what cap implications would that have down the road? If they call it quits, I would worry about the cap implication there. If they come to Calgary, they have a crappy year and they hang it up. Well, uh, that wouldn't matter because they were bef- younger than 35 when they signed the deal. So You're right. See, yeah. I just I think anyone over 35, you have that problem. But no, you're right. So, I don't know. I don't think the Sedins would be well-received here. I don't think you could really sell that, that we made a deal with our enemy, if you will, to bring the Sedins in. I think they'd get booed every night in the Dome. I don't. I don't think so. Uh, how would you say they are so vanilla that I don't like? There's no hate. It's not like Alex Burrows or Ryan Kessler. Them, yeah, they'd get booed. But I also don't know that the Sedins are who we need to build this team up. If you look at the Calgary Flames type player, we're looking for that hard nosed, more of a physical player, which the Sedins are not. And I just don't know that they're gonna fit in well here. Yeah. I know, I just like throat tossing odd things at you every once in a while. It's interesting, but I'm just thinking if I want to acquire a player and spend $7 million on them, there's other players I'd rather spend $7 million on. Can't argue with you there. You know, you know even the two for one deal, there's, I mean, there's guys I'd rather spend, I'd rather spend the couple extra and get 8 or $9 million out of than the Sedins. Yeah. Like me personally, I'd rather spend nine million and get both David Backus and Troy Brower, than because of their size and physicality than the Sedins. But I think if the Sedins move personally, I think they're going to Buffalo. I think Buffalo needs some star power, and they have the salary and the roster to make something work. Yeah, I can see that. But we'll see going forward how that plays out. Yeah, it's going to be a long, long, long time for Vancouver to dig out of this one. Any other comments on the Vancouver game? Well, not really. Uh, I was pleased that they not only won, but uh, they absolutely destroyed Vancouver just because any time you can beat Vancouver and in such a large manner it's always nice well just like the oilers five nothing i mean it's just nice to beat your rivals that much yeah and it really didn't have much draft pick implications either so you know who cares (laughs) well then if we're done talking about the canucks game let's uh, move on to the last game of the season but before we do we have to talk about the players that were recalled before the game uh the calgary flames recalled turner elson as a forward, and Oliver Shillington and Patrick Seeloff on an emergency basis from the Stockton Heat. And they were called up before the last game. This is the probably the longest list of scratches the Flames have had all year. Going into Minnesota, the Flames scratched Boma, England, Froley, Grant, Hiller, Nacladol, and Weidman. And they once again gave the net to Nicholas Backstrom in what I'm predicting right now is his last NHL game ever. 
I think this will be, I think this is a good story. If he comes back to Minnesota, he beats the team they played for, and then he rides off into the sunset. And the Flames end up winning the last game of the season, 2-1 to one over the Wild. Any thoughts here, Matt? The Minnesota Wild are going to get absolutely destroyed by the Dallas Stars in round one. I know they were resting some guys as well, but they just don't have the talent to... Yeah, I mean, the biggest names, notably, Zach Parise, Jordan Schroeder, Jared Stahl, and Thomas Vanek all out for the Wild. Yeah, like, that's not enough talent there to make a difference from what we saw. The team itself is just kind of mediocre, and it shows. They were the worst team to make the playoffs. But... It, probably in the last years. But hasn't that pretty much years. always been the Wild? I mean, I can't think of a year I've said, wow, this Wild roster is dominant. Like, to me, they've always just been this edge playoff wild card team of, yeah, okay, they'll be there, they'll compete, they'll probably make it to the playoffs to be pretty close, but there's never been a year I've said, this team's going to the Western Finals. No. Other than that time that they actually did. But even did. then, they weren't really built for it. I think it was almost a, it was a partial Cinderella season. No. That was an unexpected, yeah. No, but um, it was nice to see Backstrom get the win. Uh, it, what a better way to cap off a career if that ends up being his last game than to play the, the, as strong as he did. Do you think it will be? I don't know if that will be his last. It probably will, but it it depends. I don't think it'll be his last pro hockey game, but I think it'll be his last NHL game. Yeah, I could see somebody throwing an invite into training camp to like shore up the veteran depth if, with a more likely start in the AHL. Well, you and I talked about it. I could see signing him next year as the backup to Gillies. Yeah, and who knows? Uh, he might play again, he might not. Either way, it was a good way to end the season, at least, if not his career. And I thought this game was kind of cool, just looking at the score sheet. Um, the the first Flames goal, and the one that I thought might be the only Flames goal, I didn't, I wasn't sure as we got there if we were going to win this, but Brandon Bowley gets his second of the year, assisted by Shore and Elson, both who got their first assists of the year. And the second Flames goal is first career NHL goal was Patrick Seeloff from the blue line assisted by Backlund and Furland you and I have talked a lot about Seeloff during the the lifespan of the podcast I you know me I've thought favorably of him I've sort of lost face on him over a while I, I was too confident with him when I don't think I should have been what were your thoughts on Seeloff in this game he was steady and he did make a couple of minor mistakes like any you know, defenseman playing his first NHL game. But he was looked like a decent possible number 6-7 down the road. It might have more in him, might not. But he looked a lot better. He has been looking a lot better in Stockton as well since about January. So he might re revitalize himself. We just have to wait and see. To me, though, I think even if he has revitalized himself a bit, I think that there are other defensemen now. I know that he was he and Wotherspoon were kind of the one-two future guys for a while. But to me, there's other guys now that have emerged in the depth chart ahead of him. And I think even if he is revitalized himself, he's going to be a guy who's going to be an AHL defenseman for at least another year. Yeah, I can't argue with that. I think that you may end up seeing guys like Watherspoon and Sealoff getting traded. Not uh, just to, like, Max Reinhardt, like, just get him off of our team. But, like... I don't know. I think Watherspoon sort of re reinvigorated his, his hope with the club this year, and we might see him kept around as number seven. Yeah, but it might end up working. Like, say, like, a team needs a defenseman, and we're shopping for a goaltender it might end up working that way where you can throw a seal off or a water spoon in that trade as an asset could be it would largely depend on who and what but we could it, it might happen and i agree with you i think that both seal off and water spoon have been passed 
by all three of Anderson, uh, Shillington, and um, Hickey in terms yeah, of I think, upside. I think even though Morrison had a bad first pro year, I think he's going to rebound. Yeah, everything that could have gone wrong for him did, so... And I think with Seelov being so injury-prone in the past, you're going to have to have one better than one full healthy year from him before you rely on him at the NHL level. Can't argue there. Um, and then after the... Anything else you want to talk about with the Minnesota game? To me, it was... There's not a lot to say. The Flames won his last game of the season. Yeah, uh, just one thing. I thought Shillington... Uh, he showed flashes of being really good and flashes of the reason why he was picked 60th last year uh, he still needs to work on his defensive game and some of his instincts but his skating ability made up for a lot of his problems once he adds 20 to 30 pounds he he'll be a good player in the nhl yeah, what I was kind of seeing is he, he looks like he could be an NHLer, but he's not ready to be relied on even as the first call-up yet. No. I think Shillington's got potential, but he needs at least another year at the AHL level yeah. to really work on his game. And credit to Todd Gill for working with him in Stockton all year. He has been measuredly better than he was even at the beginning of the year. And if he can continue to work and progress, then that will be good for two to three years from now when Shillington is in the NHL full-time. Yeah, for sure. After this game, the Flames <clears throat> announced that they were sending five forwards back to the AHL now the NHL season was done. Turner Elson, Hunter Shinkarik, Drew Shore, Oliver Shillington, and Patrick Selov were all reassigned to Stockton. And that's probably good. Stockton's in a playoff push right now, and they need all the help they can get. So sending them some firepower back is going to be a good thing there. Yeah, and it's unlikely that Stockton will make the playoffs. They have to win out, and they need one of the teams to lose out. But stranger things have happened. If not, they at least they'll finish the season up strong. And good for um, both uh, Brett Pollock and Mark Jankowski for scoring their first professional goals this week. Yeah, it was. I watched Jankowski's goal online. It was a nice looking goal from from the kid. And I don't know if you saw there was an interview. Um, I saw it online from Todd um, from Ryan Hushka, the coach in Stockton, and he's got nothing but good things to say about Jankowski and his tryout so far. Yeah. He's looking as good as I was hoping he would, and he, I have no complaints. I watched a couple of the games that he's played, and he's looked really good, has been consistently one of the better players on the team. Still a little raw, but that's, you know, anybody going into their first professional games is going to be a little raw, so... It, It'll be interesting to see if he can put on some more weight even. I think it's the same situation with Colborne that could always get a little stronger. And see in September if he's ready to go. And he may end up stealing a spot. Who knows? So, Matt, we're done the season. You and I have been playing a game all year. We've been playing our weekly predictions game, which uh, has been brought to us by Tick Ticks. And we finally have the results on the season. We started off pretty bad. I mean, the whole season. No. Neither of us has been doing very well. You started You started out with a bit of a lead. I never really caught you until about March when I started to catch up, but you've always been a couple points up on me. We have the final results for the season, and unlike the NHL, we have a tie. This past week, the Flames got uh, five points. I thought we'd get four, and you thought we'd get two. We put in a tiebreaker of could any of us predict the games. We were terrible at that as well. <laughs> so we end off the season on a 6-6 six, six, uh, tie. And I guess for me, that's sort of a fitting end of the season. We were both crappy at our predictions all year. So we might as well just tie it up at the yep, end. Yep, exactly. We're both equally terrible. So, yay. We both suck the same amount. Yep. So do so we six, get a lottery six, pick or how's that going to work out? When the other NHL podcast dra uh, do their draft for, I don't know, new hosts or whatever it is in the offseason, we'll get a lottery pick. Okay. 
I don't know. Um, Who knows? We, but, well, I mean, we violated an NHL rule in that we tied, right? Technically, you and I need to find some sort of shootout that will go on indefinitely all summer. Yeah. We'll but, have to figure something out. So we've we've got a tie this year. But moving on past that, uh, you and I also made some predictions at the beginning of the season about what we expected from the 2015-2016 hmm. season. Yeah, th- this and, ain't going to be pretty. And, <laughs> and things that we wanted to look back on the be- at the end of the season and see how we did. You and I made together one, two, three, four, five, six predictions. Do you want to guess how many of them came true? Three, maybe four. All right, well, let's see. First thing we predicted is that Mason Raymond would be out as a Calgary Flame. We did not see him in a flaming sea at the end of the year. So we got that one, right? He didn't get traded, but I think you probably agree with me that we will not see Raymond back in a flaming sea. Unless he has a training camp of epic proportions, like where he scores three or four goals in as many games, then... Maybe he might crack the lineup, but I sincerely doubt that. You and I also thought that Paul Byron would be out as a Calgary Flame, and we lost him to waivers early in the year. Yeah, and credit to him, he had a really good season for Montreal. It's just the Flames need to get bigger, and it's no slight to Byron. He's a great player. It's just you can't have three guys under six feet in your top 12 no matter how good or bad they are. And that's why we see, saw Hoodler move on to Florida. So we're two for two so far, Matt. We're not doing too well. Well, Matt, we're two for two so far, so we're not doing too bad. Yeah, I'm shocked. Third one, we said that the Flames needed to go out this season and acquire a 3-4 defenseman. Would you say that in the acquisition of Yuri Okapaka, we've achieved that? No. I think Yoki Paka is more of a number six that we shoehorned into a 3-4 role just because we had no other option. I I think the Flames still need another good number four. I I think uh, Hamilton has emerged into being that number three guy. So I, I would expect more of like a veteran signing like Adrian O'Coin or Roman Hammerlick in years gone by to... Oh, I thought you were saying we signed those guys this year. I'm like, what? We're going to the old folks home? Yeah, no. But those type of guys that are just veteran quality leader types that you could... If we look at some of the guys that would be available, you could bring in a Brian Campbell, a Keith Yandel, Dan Boyle, Hamuse. Yeah, I, my personal preference would be Campbell just because he fits the type of defenseman that the flames have so i think that would be the best fit for hamilton as a partner especially because they play kind of a similar game john michael lyles might not be a bad choice either that would be probably the third or fourth choice if you couldn't get one of the other guys Matthias Oland is a free agent. I didn't know that guy was still playing. He's not. He's 39. Yeah, he's not. He's been injured all year. It's just uh, okay, that cap thing know. for Tampa. If we could get him cheap enough, I could also see placing an offer on Luke Shin. Possibly. Although I don't really want him. <laughs> I he, He's just kind of mediocre. It, it it would be more of a replacement for Derek England than anything. Hey, if he's available, would you uh, bid on Chris Russell? No, not at all. You, th- you think we're done with him? I honestly wouldn't even offer him a contract, even if he was there no. in August. So, Okay. Uh, the Flames need size, period. And as much as Chris Russell did a lot of great things for the Flames, he's still a very short player. And when you're dealing with teams like San Jose, L.A., and uh, Anaheim, who have a lot of big bodies, they're just going to push them away. And you, you just can't have that, unfortunately. If he was six foot three, so, he would probably still be here. So I don't know if I would say Yoki Pack is a six. I think he could be a five, but I'd agree with you that we did not go out and address the permanent 3-4 defenseman. I think you're right. We shoehorned Yoki Pack in there, and he's young, and he has potential. 
But to me, he's not yet a 3-4. I think he could get there. But for next year, he's a 5-6. Yeah. I, I look at him more as a replacement for Ladislav Schmid more than anything. Like, the solid defensive-minded tall guy who can throw some hits occasionally. Just solid defensively. I, I think if you're relying on him to be more than a 5-6, then your team's not very good. So, speaking of Schmid... That was the next prediction. I made this prediction. I thought that Smead would retire after a second injury this year, a second long-term injury. And I was right on the second injury. He got injured for a second time, but he has yet to announce his retirement. I don't I, see Smead coming yeah, back. Yeah, I think that you're going to – it, it's too soon to tell, but I think that you actually did get that one correct. I think that whether he officially announces retirement or he just doesn't play again and he's put on long-term injury, I don't think we see this guy play pro hockey again at any level. No. Uh, I agree on that count. And I think especially after the whole Weidman concussion thing, the NHL is going to be really, really careful before they bring a guy back who's had a head or neck injury. And that's why I think that now more than maybe at the beginning of the year, Schmid's probably not coming back. I would be positively shocked if he ever played for the Flames again. And that, that's not to say that he's a bad player or anything like that. If he was healthy, I'd be more than happy to see him in the lineup. It's just you have to look at what's good for your long-term health. And for him playing a contact sport when you've suffered eight or nine neck injuries, that's not a good thing. So should we chalk that up to undefined, or should we say that that's probably true? I'll give you three quarters of a point. All right. Um, the next two were our playoff predictions. Matt, you were optimistic, unlike most of your predictions this year. In our weekly game, you thought the Flames would make the playoffs this year. Yeah, and if you look at the team, it, they should have. Like it, The good players on the team... They all had career years. Like Nine of the 20 players had career years. It's just the other 11 were so bad that that's what cost the team. And unfortunately, you need all 20 players to play at a certain level. They didn't, and the Flames are picking fifth right now. And I predicted that the Flames would not make the playoffs this year, which means that together, if we're going to give three quarters of a point for the Smeed, of our six, we got three and three quarters. Yeah. So we did better than half, which is better than we've done for most of our predictions the rest of the yeah. year. Yeah. Well, yeah. The Flames, the top nine players, like the, it's like the Flames are half a contending team and then half of like the worst AHL team in the league and you combine the two and like there's just that gulf of talent between the good players and the not so good players and uh, if the flames can address even modifying the team where seven or eight of those lesser talented players are removed or otherwise exchanged for quality then I expect the Flames to be in contention for the division next year. It's just... Well, let's talk about that point. So, as we know, the Flames have a motto that they put in last year, always earned, never given. And we saw that last year. A player who wasn't playing well was taken out of the lineup. A new player was called up from Stockton to replace them, or at the time, Adirondack to replace them. This year we saw guys in the lineup who... Honestly, a lot of times didn't belong there. I think the only time we really saw the always earned, never given was the beginning of the season with the three goaltender shuffle and then near the end of the year when Raymond was sent down. But, I mean, Raymond was waived early. Bow League was in the lineup most of the year. Matt, what do you think changed here? There's a lot of guys, like I would say Bow League was one of them. Raymond was too late. Why were these guys given the leash they were? Not just said you're not playing well. Even a guy like Juris, you're not playing Increased well. Increased expectations. Sit down, bringing somebody up. I think that the you Flames that believed that they were destined to be a playoff team this year, and so they thought that they would ice the best lineup possible, which was the veteran-laden team that they had 
from last year because we didn't really modify too many things other than adding Sam Bennett to the lineup regularly. And for a leak. And for a leak. Up front, anyway. So, we should have been better if... But even then, by the time January and February roll around, and we knew that, I mean, we pretty much knew we were out of this thing, they seemed to still drag their heels until the deadline as far as, you know, bringing young players into the lineup. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I know. Yeah, like, after the mediocre January that we had, the Flames were pretty much done at that point. And they just... I mean, it's not like we didn't know we were going to be deadline sellers until the day before. We knew long before yeah. that this team was going to be selling. And it's a situation where they have too many contracts for players that are underperforming and still have years left on them. And they're trying to figure out a way to get rid of those contracts, I'm sure. And the only way you can do that is by playing them. It's just the catch-22 is if they're playing badly and they're in the lineup, then that decreases your chances of winning. And But even a guy like Brennan Bowley got a million and a quarter, $1.25 million for two years. Like To me, that's the kind of salary I have no problem sending to Stockton. Yeah. And, and Bowley didn't play well at all this year. I think that his whole role has sort of been obsoleted. So I'm puzzled as to why he's still wearing a flaming C in game 82 yeah honestly i think garnett hathaway if the, even from day one if they just put him in the lineup even though he's only one professional season that would have been a huge upgrade and i think that was a lot of the reason looking back that the flames won as much as they did last year and won all the way to round two is Guys are competing for jobs. You know, you put Hathaway in, and then a guy like Bowling wants the job, so he works harder. And then he takes it back, and then Hathaway works harder. But this year it just seemed like, oh, well, if you started the year with a flaming C, you're going to keep it until it's like, crap, we moved Hoodler. we got to bring somebody up to fill it. Uh, you know, you're the next guy. And I think that the Flames might have been able to reinvigorate some of that if early on they sent messages to players. They said to a guy like Raymond, you've been waived. You're going to the AHL. Someone else is getting your job. We need to keep that competition going. You know, that's part of what made the season work last year. And I guess I'm just, I'm shocked that that didn't, I I, under, I agree with you that it's because we thought we were a playoff team. I think we were pretending too late in the season that we were still eligible but they they need to get back to that i think yeah. they need to be pushing guys up and down until this rebuild is done and during this rebuild that's how you're going to get the best play out of everybody yeah i think the worst thing that happened to the flames was that winning streak in december because it gave them false hope that they were because like even though they won the seven games in a row, they didn't really look that great in any of the games. It's just they happened to win all of them in a row. And I think that gave them more of a thought of, oh, well, maybe if we just keep winning, you know, if we fall into a winning streak again, that we might be able to get back into this. And I think that was what helped to cement that yeah i guess what scares me about this is it's reminding me of the jerome mcginla era where okay you have an nhl contract you're safe you know and we saw a lot of guys during that era who played bad seasons but they just didn't want to do anything with the contract yeah and i don't want to get back to that i don't want to get back to well you have a one-way deal so you're going to wear a flaming sea regardless i think until this team has finished its rebuild in two to three years we need to be not afraid to shift those guys around say you know what bowling you're okay but let's try hathaway oh he's better all right down you go yeah well realistically for me i don't want to see any of brandon bowling matt stajan or dennis weidman wearing a flaming sea next year and I think that our offseason will be a failure if all three of those players are on the team or are in Calgary, more specifically. Like, if they're moved yeah, to I, Stockton, I think, who cares? I was going to say, I think if you say they're not in the Calgary organization, you're kidding yourself. I can. I think we're going to have to bury at least one of those contracts because, to me, none of them are worth buying out. No. Maybe Bolig, but I... 
At 1.25, I could buy that out, but I don't want to buy out the big contract of Stajan nor the big contract of Weidman. Yeah, I think both of those... Like, uh, if they're in Calgary and they're holding roster spots, I consider the offseason a failure right there. Uh, that's not being overly harsh. It's just that none of those players are playing at an NHL level anymore. And, yeah, you're making... A, almost 10 million dollars between you but we have players making 800,000 that are better like i honestly Derek grant played better in his handful of games in calgary than matt stajan did all year i think weidman will be fairly easy to move because he's got one year left he's essentially a rental next year yeah and there's plenty of teams that could use somebody with a slap shot like his like a team like edmonton even could use one matt stajan at three point one two million and he has a no movement clause of some kind uh we don't know exactly if it's full or non i think staging is going to be the tricky contract to move and i honestly think we're going to have to eat it and send it to the hl for a year and then hopefully it clears itself up in an expansion draft yeah i think staging would be a fine player to take an expansion draft i think he's a good serviceable nhl team for a for an expansion team who's going to need a couple of years to get steam going yeah if the Flames do have to keep staging due to his no movement clause, then, like, I would honestly, if the a team wants him, any team wants him, and the Flames are willing to eat half of his contract, then so be it. Sorry, here according to generalfanager.com, he has a no trade clause, not a no movement, so he could be waived and sent to the farm. Then. Okay, well then I think that may end up being what needs to be done, and it's disappointing because of who he is. Like, I like Stajan as a person, it's just he seemed to lose a step or two this year versus... Well, and to and to me, stajan has been here long enough that he's had a lot of chances. I'd say probably more chances than he deserved. Yeah. I know. That was one of those contracts the day it was signed, that second four-year deal that I was like, eh, the day it was signed. Uh, unfortunately, uh, it's turning out to be a bit of a bad contract, but... You know, he was a Daryl Sutter guy. He was brought in on the FNUF deal. And, again, I like Stajan. I think he's a good person from what I've seen around the community and all that. But I think he's a guy that should have left shortly after Daryl left as well. Yeah. But it is what it I is. Just, and yep. it, if the Flames, because the, they did use him as a winger in the last game, having him as, like, a fourth-line winger, that might be okay but it, even then, he would be on the ropes again, if we're like Raymond at, was. If we're looking at always earn, never given, I'd say send him to the AHL. Make him earn his way up as a center. Yeah. You know, hey, you want to play in the NHL? Great, show us. Grant's got your job. Oh, play this kid. You have for y years. I mean, you were a steady NHLer. Oh, play this kid again, and the job's yours. Yep. You know, I think that would be fair. It's all right, staging... You know, assume that you're starting this. Uh, right now, we assume he's going to start next year as a flame. So I would be saying to Grant in his exit interview, outplay Stajan, the job's yours. I'd be telling Stajan in the uh, exit interview, outplay Grant or we're sending you down. And create that competition coming into next year. Yep. And if the flames can move Stajan, great. If not, you just have to deal with it. So we'll see what happens there. Um, but, yeah, I think you're right about... Well, especially with the fact that the Flames have so many players that are getting close to being NHL players. Guys like Agostino, Hamilton, Poirier, Jankowski, Klimchuk to an extent, Arnold. They're going to need to move some guys from the middle to lower end of the roster... Especially if they can't, if the players that are currently in those spots, guys like Furland and Juris and that, if they're not playing at a good enough level, then, you know, we have plenty of guys that are champing at the bit to steal spots. So, I honestly, I if you're Nate, 
forwards if your name isn't Gaudreau, Monaghan, Bennett, Colborn, Backlund, or Froelich, your job's on the line. And any of those players can be replaced, and most of them should be. So talking about that, um, any surprises this year, good or bad? Let's start with the good. Did anyone surprise you for the better, a guy who had a better season than you expected? Uh, Joe Colborn. I think he finally is starting to get comfortable at the NHL level, and his 45 points or 44 points was a huge increase from his last two years. Yeah, I'd agree with Colborn on the front end. Um, I think he was a pleasant surprise. I would also add in there Dougie Hamilton uh, for me is a pleasant surprise. I think that I expected, especially based on what we saw in training camp, I think that Hamilton finally about Christmas or January finally started to come around. And by the end of the year, we started to see Dougie Hamilton, I think the version of him that we're expecting to see is number three defenseman going forward I also want to add to that list Sean Monahan. I think that Monahan has finally found his role on the team he's he had a great year or sorry not Sean Monahan. let me try that again I also want to add to that list Michael Backlund I think that Michael Backlund has finally found his role on this team I think for a while he was looked at as that first line sniper guy and I think now he's starting to really become more of a playmaker more of sort of a a playmaker with that offensive edge, and I think that with the line mates he has, we're really starting to see him become the player they should be. Well, I don't think I would ever have considered Backlund as a sniper, really, but... I don't think I'd consider him that, but I think that's kind of how the organization was looking at him for a while, as being that that big shooter. Okay. I don't agree with you. But... Okay, well, that's yeah, fine. Yeah, I just don't agree with that, but... I've always thought of him being a more of that uh, quality defensive-minded center that could chip in some offense. And now he's starting to show that there may be more offense to his game than perhaps we expected from him. I know earlier in the season I was... He had a 39-point season in 2013-2014 and 47 points this year. Yeah, I... Earlier in this season, I think you and I both th- discussed po- the possibility of Backlund getting dealt. And ever since then, he's really turned it on. I personally wouldn't trade him at this point. I think he showed more than what he had in his prior Flames career, and he was finally healthy all year, which I'm sure he was pleased about. Because it seemed like whenever he started to get going, he'd get hurt. And then it would take him a while to get back in the shape mm-hmm. again. Yeah, I think he's been healthy pretty much all year this year. And yeah. he played every game, so that, you know, I think that's a first for him. So whether he's going to be the second, third line center for the, like five years from now or not, I don't know. But at, it. Like, if the Flames fluke out and win the draft lottery and take Austin Matthews, that might change things, but he's playing really well, and it's like having two for leaks out there where good at both ends of the ice, solid, dependable, and responsible, and that's what you want out of your middle six forwards. The last guy I'll add to my list of good surprises is Yoni Ordeo. We saw him at the beginning of the year struggling to get a foothold here. He was a number three goalie. He went down to the AHL and struggled. And he got recalled uh, late in the year after Ramo got hurt. I think, to me, Ordeo's done an admirable job based on what he was given and where the Flames are in the standings. To me, he's earned himself, unless we can find somebody markedly better, he's earned himself a backup job next year. I can agree with that. I... I know that uh, both you and I, at up until Ramo got hurt, were basically figuring that his time in the organization was over. Well, I think everybody was. He was the backup in the AHL at that time. Yeah, and he came in and earned a spot, I think, 
somewhere in the organization next year. Yeah, I was expecting at some point he would be sent back to the end. Poulon would be given a job. I just didn't think Ordeo would play nearly as many games as he did. No, and he played really well for not necessarily in the stats department, but he was probably the best of the goalies this year. Even He got the job done for what the Flames needed based on where they were at. Yeah, and he needs to figure out why he has those bad starts. And I think it might just be happenstance that he just can't get into it right away or whatever. It Like, the issues between his ears more than anything. But if he can have a good start next year, then maybe he might take another step in his development. He's at that right age where guys do come out on and become quality NHL goaltenders because that was roughly around the age that Kipper was when he... Yeah, he's 24 right now. Yeah, it, Kipper was a little older actually, 26, 27 when he came to Calgary. But he, there's a possibility that he may take those next steps over the next 18 months or so Based on what we're seeing in the goalie market, I don't see us trading for a backup. I think if you look at the options, you put him and Poulon, resign them both, put them both in camp, one of them wins the job. And if yeah. Ordeo can keep his momentum the way it was at the end of the season, I think it's his job to lose. Honestly, I think if you're re-signing Ordeo, I think you just tell him you're the backup. Win or lose, you're the backup. And that might help him confidence-wise and sort out some of his issues for in that regard. And honestly, I think if the Flames are going to get anybody, it'll be a guy like James Reimer and just run with him as the 50-game starter. And yeah, we'll we'll talk we'll talk a little bit more about guys we'll bring in. But yeah, I, I think that uh, Ordeo. He, if you look at the story of Ordeo this year, he had a, it was a good story, and I think you got to say that he was a good surprise in this team. Yeah, he was both simultaneously a disappointment and a surprise. But he turned it around, yeah. right? I mean, well, that's why, like, he kind of fit both of those categories at points this year. So good for him to rebuild himself after looking like that was it so good for him on the other on the other side of the coin disappointments i'll start on this one i think for me guys that i was expecting a much better year from and i know he was injury prone but lance boma uh we needed him to be healthy all year and i think that that would have helped the flames a lot i think brandon bowling and mason raymond both disappointed me and the biggest disappointment for me jonas hiller like this guy does not look like a guy who know who should be playing goaltender at any professional level. What do you think, Matt? Yeah, um, for me, if you're not one of the guys that was having a career season, I think every single player on that list, even younger players like Michael Furland and Josh Juris, all of them in my books are disappointments. And honestly, any of those players, including guys like Dennis Weidman, Hiller, Ramo, all of them, if the Flames can replace them, then so be it. And See, the reason I would I personally don't look at a guy like Fer, Ferlander Juris as a disappointment is I think it's a failure of management to have left them in the NHL to disappoint. I think that if you would have rotated those guys out to the AHL, they might have had well, better seasons. the problem with that is that they would have been exposed to waivers, and I think they would have got claimed, and that's... Uh, yeah, I don't know, though, but I I mean, I know people like Furland, but if we lose Furland, is that really a big deal? At this point, no. But there's that potential upside, because, like, he... If you look at uh, the teams that are successful in the playoffs, LA and Chicago, they always have those guys that are really annoying in the playoffs. The uh, guys like Andrew Shaw or Nolan and King with Los Angeles that 
their sole purpose is to just be a pain in the ass to play against and Furlan did that very effectively in that series against Vancouver so I wouldn't write him off I think a lot of teams would jump at the chance to acquire him just for that it's just that he needs to learn how to play like you can't be uh, Brian Bickle and just be good in the playoffs and then that's it Another guy that I'm going to add to my list here, uh, just looking at my notes, Marcus Granlin. I know he's not a flame anymore, but I, I guess there's two ways to look at this. I was disappointed that Granny was not able to make the step that I thought he needed to make to cementing himself as a full-time NHLer for the Flames. So I think he was disappointing from that respect. I was expecting this guy to be a 3-4 guy, maybe even, like you said, take Stajan's job. But I also think he was a good surprise in what he was able to net us. If you would have said to me at the beginning of the year, we're going to trade Granlin for Shinkarik, I would have thought that you were crazy. Yeah, and I agree on with everything you said. Uh, I think that he had a higher degree of expectation coming into this year, and he just simply didn't meet it. And it in his games with Vancouver, he's been absolutely dreadful for them. So And he's a guy who came up, the Flames gave him the chance to prove himself, he didn't, and they moved on from him. And yeah, there might be some potential there, there might be, you know, maybe he turns into a great player, but we made a decision that I think will end up being the better decision in the long term. Yeah, and that's the thing with why the Flames need to have a large amount of prospects in their organization, because some of them are going to fail. Like, guys like Poirier, Klimchuk, Jankowski, Chillington, Anderson, like all of those guys, several of them aren't going to work out. And that's why you need to have those options available to you. And they did manage to get another player in Shinkarik to add to that group. And some of them will turn out, and you will get a couple of quality top nine forwards out of that group some won't and hopefully the flames management can just turn them around into other players that may contribute down the road yeah no there there's no question there you got to move guys on and i think that's going to be one of the biggest things to go you know maybe we like a guy like juris maybe we see potential there but at some point you have to say we've tried it it didn't work here away you go yeah and that's the good thing about having as many top-end picks that the Flames have had recently and will have this year, that you can cycle out guys. Because like if uh, a team likes Juris a lot and thinks that he'd be a good middle, bottom nine forward or whatever, you might be able to either acquire a draft pick or a different prospect for him and you know, you can create that spot opening for a guy like Poirier to come in. Similar to what we saw with the Reinhardt deal. Exactly. Well, Matt, let's look ahead then. We've talked about what we saw and what the disappointments were, but let's look ahead to next season. Um, this Flames roster needs changes, as you mentioned. There's a lot of guys that could be interchangeable here. Flames have a number of free agents. Let's go through all the unrestricted free agents and one at a time say who we think they'll re-sign. So the UFAs in this team, we have Derek Grant. Do you think he's back or he's gone? I would prefer that he's re-signed for his face-off ability, but if the Flames can't guarantee him a contract, like a, a spot in the NHL, I think he's gone. He's making 700000 two-way right now. I'd be willing to go up to a million with this guy on a one- or two-year deal. Same here. Next UFA, so we'll both say for Grant that he's we'd like him to be in. Mm -hmm. uh, Jakob Naklaudel on the blue line, another UFA. I'll start with this guy. I want Naklaudel back. I think that he earned himself at least another year. He's making 817000 on a two-way now. Again, I'd give this guy a million and sign him to a two-year deal. The well, same... It, it might be the same situation as David Schlemko, though, where we have too many guys and not enough spots for him. But then you can use him as value and get rid of him later. 
Yeah, well... Or move somebody else out if you need to. Yeah, and that's where what the situation with Dennis Weidman, if the Flames can just move him somewhere, anywhere, then I, I would expect Nicolaudel to be back and taking his spot. I think for a million, million two, you almost sign Nicolaudel anyways and figure out what to do with him later. Yeah, and that's the same situation where the player deserves to be in the NHL. He might sign somewhere else that's guaranteeing him a spot. Ideally, yeah, we'll he would see. be back, though. Um, the next UFAs, three of them in the same position. All of them wear a mask and pads when they play. Jonas Hiller, Nick Backstrom, and Kerry Ramo. Let's do them all at once. Any of those guys you expect to see back or you want to see back in a flaming sea? No, no, no. I think Hiller and Backstrom are done in the NHL. Same here. Um, I maybe they play in Europe. I think Ramo is going to get an is going to get an NHL job next year, but not in Calgary. I can see this guy getting a backup or a one B job somewhere, um, but I think it's time to move on from the Kerry Ramo experiment in Calgary. Yeah, I think you may see him go to a team like Carolina, who could use him as a starter kind of situation with Lack or a. Toronto even uh, I think he is probably the second best option after James Reimer so you know for UFAs I I could honestly see the Flames Leafs and uh, Hurricanes doing like a three way goalie trade where Reimer comes to either us or Carolina Toronto and Calgary get Ward and or Ramo goes to which of the other two? But instead of a trade, it would just be UFA swapping yeah. jerseys. You know what I mean, though. Yeah, I I think that yeah of those three, I think that I think after the year we have and the fact that you can blame a lot of the year on goaltending, if any of those guys gets re-signed, it shows a lack of commitment from management to make a change. Yeah, there's no reason those guys need to be back here. And, you know, it's convenient to do so, but the hard choice has to be made to let them all go. Yeah, I... Any of those guys of coming back to Calgary is only marginally higher than zero. And, like, not even 1%. Because I think well, there's just to too the... many options via trade or UFA. I would sooner give Anti Ranta a shot than I would Ramo. Well, that's it. And I don't think we're in a playoff spot next year. I don't think we're in a spot where we must have that playoff goaltender. So I think even if it takes us a couple of years and a guy like Ranta is the holdover until we see what we really have with Gillies, I think that that's fine for where we're going to be at. Yeah. I disagree with you. I think we will be a playoff team next year, but... Oh. This coming from the guy who thought we'd be a playoff team this year. I think that we've firmly identified the players that need to be replaced where last year we didn't. So I think okay. that we'll take steps to address that. We'll see. Yeah. Um, RFAs. Guys, remember that these are all guys the Flames can qualify, probably will qualify, um, and they get the first crack to re-sign them. Even if the player doesn't sign here and signs with another professional league, not in the NHL, we retain their rights. Joel Colborn, qualified and re-signed? Yep. And a uh, three year, seven and a half to eight and a half is what I'm expecting. For Colborn? Yep. Okay. Combined. So like two and oh. a half million to three. I see. Okay. Uh, Josh Juris. Retained, but if they can trade him or otherwise, I could see that happen. I think you retain the rights. If you can sign him for under a million, you do it. Yeah, it, I don't still... think he's earned more than his 975. No, I think if you can do it for a million even one way, that's fine. That's a deal we can easily slide back down. And if we lose him on waivers, I'm fine with that. Yeah, but I agree. I, I think that he's still a valuable part of the organization. I don't know if he's a valuable part of the Calgary Flames next year, but I think he's a valuable part of the organization. Uh, Sean Monahan and Johnny Goudreau. Is there any question that they get retained? Um, some. <laughs> Not. <laughs> I, what I, kind of deal do you think we see for these two? Uh, 
I'm hoping for like an eight year 6.75 each. I think because uh, Giordano, his contract is 6.75. Six point seven five. Yep. So I think if you had all three of your main players in your team being that same six point seven five, I think that would be perfect. Yeah, I think what we're gonna see here is a bit of an overpayment for Monahan and a bit of a discount on Goudreau's. How it's gonna work out? I think that I think they're gonna get about seven years, and I'm gonna say seven million each. I could see that too. I think you you pay a little. I think Goudreau is probably worth about eight, nine, maybe on the open market. So you get a bit of a discount on him. I don't think Monahan's worth seven, but I think you overpay and it sort of evens itself out in the end. Yeah, I'm. But I think I'm those kind guys of get the same term. in like thirteen and a half to fourteen for the two. Yeah, yeah. Do you think there's any question if they get the same term? No, I think it's going to be exactly the same years. I think the next seven or eight, are, sorry. either way. I don't see anything yeah. shorter than that. No, I can't either. Um, Giordano's in until 2022, so I think we'll go more than that because these guys are younger than Gio, obviously, um, by about 10 years. But, yeah, I think it'll be a seven- or eight-year deal. I think these are the kind of deals you lock up that are, you know, no movement, seven years, you, you know, take that clause off five years in, something like that. You're pretty standard superstar contracts. Yeah, exactly. They're basically the Flames version of uh, Jonathan Taze and Patrick Kane. So sign them accordingly as much long as possible, as much dollars as is reasonable, and good to go. Next RFA is Drew Shore. I'd qualify him because he's still a decent player, but if he's just an AHL vet, that's fine. I'd qualify him. He's currently making 850 two way. I think I'd sign him for the same kind of deal. Yeah. If he earns a way into the NHL next year, great. If not, he's a veteran guy like Kanowski was before. Who cares? Turner Elson? Yeah, I'd definitely sign him. He's the organizational guy that you want the type of guy that gives everything every shift every game he, even just and he's for, really starting to come into his own in the AHL too yeah it, he's the type of player that other players look to see what needs to be done in terms of effort level He's not the most talented player by any stretch. I don't even think he'll ever be a full-time NHL or at any point. But just that quality, giving everything for the team type of guy. You just keep those types, period. He's making 600 2 way That's an appropriate deal for him. Might even go 700 2 way Yeah, whatever. The dollars don't really matter in terms of what you're paying is AHL contract. I think it's only like 80,000 or 90. So big deal. Um, what about Yoni Ordeo? To me, I would qualify him and sign him. I think we get this guy for less than a million. It's got to be short term because he is, you know, a little bit unproven. But I think two, three years for Ordeo, you can't go wrong. I mean, if you need to, there's always going to be some team that's willing to take a young goalie off your hands. Yeah, I'd go probably one year on him at like 900000 like whatever the league minimum is, on a one-way. Okay. And, okay, this is your shot. You're the backup. If we have to sign you next year for like $1.5 or $2 million, that's fine. But I'd only do one year just because you don't want a bad contract on your books. Beyond that. I don't think you can ever classify a $900,000 contract a bad contract. Well, though. just having the roster spot taken up is what I was meaning by... Yeah. Yeah, maybe. Um, Tyler Watherspoon. Easy resign. B Bryce Van Brabrandt. I'd let him walk. I'd agree with that one. I'd agree with Watherspoon, too. I think Van Brabrandt has come around a bit in the AHL this year, but I think... 
he has a position that could be easily replaced. Well, you also have to look at the fact that Manjapan and Pollock are both graduating to the AHL next year. They need somewhere yeah, to I play. I think Pollock could easily take his roster position. Yeah, so you need somewhere. And Ben Braeburn's 24. I mean, if you're not showing what you need to show by 24, you're probably not coming around as a forward. Yeah. Uh, Bill Arnold. Yeah, sure. Nothing wrong with I, him. Uh, no, I think at least he's a serviceable AHL guy next year. So I'd I'd bring him back. Yeah, one more contract if he doesn't earn his way to the NHL then, by then. And if the Flames did walk away from him, that'd be fine too. Because he's been injured for most of the time anyway. Yeah, but sometimes you got to let, let a guy have another shot. I mean, he looked pretty good last year when he was healthy. Yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. It, it's one of those where either way is fine. If they decide to walk away, that's fine. If they sign him, that's fine, too. What about Kenny Agostino? Same thing. I, I'd be I perfectly fine keeping him or letting him walk. To me, I'm starting to see Agostino coming around in, I think, potentially having shades of an NHL player. I want to see this guy for at least one more year before we give up on him. Yeah. Um, Freddie Hamilton. Easy re-sign. Yeah. He's cheap. He's 687000 resign re-sign the kid. Yeah, and, and his brother plays for us, so, you know, uh, always good to have, keep the young, good defenseman happy <laughs> for the long term. And what about Kevin Poulon? I'd let him walk. I think I'd re-sign Poulon, if nothing else, as the AHL. I mean, if you're not going to bring in a veteran guy, I well, think that Poulon... Well, that's why... I'd let him walk because I'd try to find some veteran goalie to play instead. Maybe. It, I guess that depends. Yeah, if you're going to go out and shoot for a veteran goalie, then yeah, let Poulon walk. If you're not, I think Poulon could be a decent backup for Gillies. And I'd agree with you under that situation. So, yeah, I mean, if you want to go My find first that. choice would be getting a guy like Peter Budai or Yan Danny. Yeah, no, if, if you can get one of those guys, let him walk. If not, then... I think Poulon's a serviceable number two AHL guy. Mm-hmm. Sign him one more year, you know, see what happens. Can't argue so, with you there. So those are the guys that we would re-sign. Um, really, we've talked about the guys that we could see departing from this team. Matt, are there anyone, any new faces you can see coming? Any UFAs who you can see potentially donning the Flaming Sea next year? Well, I think the, the four main targets for the I'll make it five main targets for the team. Uh, Milan Lucic, David Backus, Troy Brower, Brian Campbell, and James Reimer. Um, a veteran defenseman in Campbell, and three big tough forwards between Backus, Lucic, and Brower, and a decent goalie in Reimer. Don't have the money to bring them all in, though. No. Uh, I would expect that you'd at most get three of those guys maybe four so we know that the flames need some help uh on the right wing and if we take a look at those guys i think that's where the flames right wing and goal are where they're going to look the most at um troy brower is a right winger yeah and same with bacchus yep and i could see either one of those guys coming i know you've talked about ocposo would you rather have a guy like Brower or would you rather have Ocposo? I uh, uh, Brower, I would have rather have Ocposo, but for you're talking like a four million dollar player versus six to seven guy. That's true. Bacchus, he'd probably be a six to seven guy as well. So I'd rather have Bacchus due to his size because Ocposo is only six feet. But there's the age trade-off as well. I think what you'll it will largely depend on who the Flames get in the draft. If the Flames are getting, and say they luck out and get Lene or Puliu Yarvi, those guys you can slot in in the NHL right away because they're both six foot four scoring forwards. You're gonna be putting them on right wing maybe even starting them with Gaudreau right off the bat. So you're not necessarily going to need that scoring right winger anymore. You're going to need more of the depth guy 
So a guy like Troy Brower might make more sense than a, a David Backus or a Kyle Poso. If the Flames are picking, say, fifth and they get Pierre-Luc Dubois, then your center and left wing on the second line are now addressed. So you'll need more right wingers. So Backus would make more sense. So it largely, I think it'll depend on what the Flames end up drafting more than anything. To me, I think Bacchus is going to bring probably the biggest bidding war of those three. Yeah, same here. And I don't know that he would want to come play in Calgary. I think that there might be better offers. I mean, not that he doesn't want to play here, but I just think he might get better offers than us. True. But you could also say, hey, you get to play with Johnny Goudreau. So, yeah. you know, that might be the tipping balance there. Of those guys, I think the Brower and or Ocposo are going to be the the more likely targets. Same here. And I think, honestly, that Ocposo will probably be the guy the Flames end up bringing in simply due to age. And I can agree with that, too. And especially if they're spending a big contract um, on Goudreau Monaghan. I mean, Ocposo is making $2.8 million a year. I think we could get him for less than four. I think it uh, might just No, be... he's going to be over six. You think so? Oh, easily. So over you're, six so you're i looking, could even see seven from some team okay so you're so you're looking at a contract very similar to the uh goudreau monahan yeah okay. easily because 60 point right wingers don't come on the market too often that's true okay so uh ideally you'd get them for under five but it, that there's virtually no way that that's going to happen if I'm signing him long term, if I'm signing one of these guys long term, I want Ocposo. Yeah. If I I'm... think that if you're signing either Bacchus or Brower, it's likely going to be a four year contract. I was going to say three, but yeah, I could see four. Yeah, because they're both 31, so up to 35, I think that would be perfectly fine as a veteran right winger. I think that. It, for the Flames, like, what they're going to try and do is if they don't address the right wing position in the draft this year, saying getting either Pooley, RV or Lene, then they're going to be looking to get that in subsequent drafts, whether that's the first round next year or whatever. This year, after the first round, there's not really any right wingers with size at all. So, uh, if they strike out in the first round, I don't see them getting one beyond that. No, I think so. you have to bring somebody in either via UFA or trade to shore up the team for now. Yeah, exactly. Doesn't so. have to be a six year deal, but I think three years, four years, by then it gives you options in the draft where you're not drafting a right winger just to take one but you can really try to let some of these guys come through and develop. Exactly. And you're not and pushing I think, a guy to the NHL who might not be ready yet. Yeah, and like I could see the Flames offering Weidman to a team that needs a defenseman for a middle six right winger. Like I've heard one idea being Yakupov for Weidman plus other things like whatever the particulars and something like that might make sense. Could be. You mentioned a name earlier, uh, Milan Lucic. Lucic is a guy I've liked for a long time. Lucic is a guy I've said I'd like to see as a flame for a long time. I think that with the money you're going to spend on a right winger and the money that you're going to spend on Goudreau Monaghan, we've priced ourselves out of the Lucic market. What do you think? Yeah, I think that the only way you would sign Lucic is if the Flames luck out and get one of those prospects in the draft, the two big right wingers. So that way you could put Bennett on the second line center with Lucic as the left winger on that line. And then you can just sort out and fill in the uh, secondary right wing position, whether it's Froelich or new acquisition via trade in that case. I think if you were to look at like a Goudreau Monaghan, like we said, averaging about $7 million each, you look at someone like Ocposo maybe making six or seven, and I think Lou Cheech would be about the same range. $28 million is a lot of money to spend in one summer on forwards. Yeah, 
but the Flames need it. They do, really. but I, but but I it, think well, that if, if the Flames want to make the playoffs... But I think before you can bring that kind of money in, there's a lot of peats to move out, and I don't know you can do it all in one summer. Uh, yeah, and Trail Living will be busy, but if the Flames want to return to the playoffs next year, they simply have to do stuff like that in order to take the team the next step. Like, you can't just uh, have our top seven being what it is and then just not add anything to it or just add the first round draft pick and call it a day no i think you'll get one of the wingers i think you'd get ocposo or brower or lucic but i don't think you get both sides no up. i think you'll get a right or a left but you're not gonna end up with an ocposo and a lucic or a brower and a lucic coming yeah. in like uh, how i'm penciling it in our first round draft pick assuming it's a forward will one of take one of those top nine spots. Whether it's Lene or Pouliarvi on the first line or a guy like Kachuk or Dubois on the second and third lines. Whichever way that works out. Then you address one of the other spots via trade. Ideally Wideman or it might not ne not necessarily be something like that. It might be trading some prospects for a top nine winger then you add one free agent and you're good to go yeah i can see that happening um what about on the back end matt we we move out weidman um we've still got a gaping hole at sort of the the number four i think that we can all agree the giordano brody and hamilton are one two three yeah that's why i think a guy like campbell or some of the other names that you mentioned earlier would make sense as a veteran number four and having Yoki Paka and Nacladdle and Watherspoon being the five, six, seven would be perfect. Camel's making seven million this year. I don't think he's worth that next year. Oh what no, he'd, he'd probably be in the back. four million, three to four. For three to four million, I'd bring him in. I mean, he's thirty six. I'd bring him in on a one year deal. I uh, two for me. Because I think that you think you're so? going to see like anybody who would normally be signed for a one year getting a two just for the expansion draft. Okay. Yeah, you, that's true. I forgot about the expansion yeah. draft. You could be right. Because I think that's what you're going to end up seeing is basically everybody that was a one year deal get two just so, hey, we need to get a quarter of our cap yeah. exposed. No, so. So, so let's put the caveat on that then. If the expansion draft is announced probably two if not probably yeah. one and i oh yeah i forgot about england so nacladdle england and yogi paka being the five six seven guys under that situation yeah i think it could be right i think the d is the area that needs the least shoring up this yeah. summer they already kind of did that with getting yogi paka and adding nacladdle so and hamilton last mm -hmm. summer so they're pretty much good to go the biggest area you need to look is in goal. Uh, if all three, if all of our goalies are leaving except for Ordeo, as we mentioned earlier, we need to find ourselves a starter. And if we take a look at the list of available starters, you mentioned some of them. Cam Ward, Ben Scrivens, James Reimer, uh, Al Montoya, Jonas Enroth, Antti Ranta. What do, would you go UFA for a goalie? Or would you try to trade for a guy if there is an expansion draft like a Bishop or an Anderson? Well, it... I don't see Frederick Anderson getting traded to the Flames. I think that uh, Toronto makes the most sense just due to the fact that they're not in conference and in division, and Toronto has a whole ton of draft picks because of all the trades they've made. So I think that makes the most sense there. Uh, I think that what you'll see, because you can negotiate at the before the draft with all the UFAs, that the Flames will talk to Reimer and Ward and just see what they're looking at. And if it makes sense, then you just agree to a contract, wait for July 1st, and you're good to go. If both of them are asking way too much money or way too much term, then guys like Mike Smith, Marc-Andre Fleury, Ben Bishop, or the prospects that they're being replaced by eventually would start to make more sense 
To me, I think that if I'm looking at a UFA, and I think you'd get him fairly reasonably, it'd be James Reimer. Yeah, I think um, for Reimer, but, like a three-year at four and a half would make sense for both sides. The only thing I could see is Toronto outbidding us and bringing Reimer back. I think they, that boat sailed on for them. You think yeah, so? I think the only direct competition for him would be Carolina, and even then, I doubt that they're too much interested in signing somebody for a larger term that because they have Eddie Lack plus two guys that are uh, good prospects coming up so I think that they're more apt to sign somebody cheaper like uh, Ranta instead and there's not really anybody else that's in dire need of a starting goaltender so. so I know that you, you and I have different opinions on this team next year. You think they're going to the playoffs. I don't. Um, if we were a playoff team and if that's the plan, I would be okay spending whatever it takes to go out and trade for one of the goalies you mentioned, a guy like Fleury or Bishop. However, thinking that we're a couple years away from the playoffs, I think the Flames' best move is to bring in either – Andy Ranta, Anders Lindback, or Jonas Enroth, one of those sort of backup guys who's in their late 20s who can potentially tide us over for two, three years while we figure out what we've got in the organization. Yeah. I think that, that would be selling the team short. Uh, I think that would be basically just wasting a couple of years in that situation. Uh the Flames could do that. I think that you're just wasting time if that's the way you go. Because so I think the players are good know. enough where if you just make a couple of alterations that this team's good to go. I agree with you there, but I think what you'd have to give up to get one of the goalies you're well, mentioning, it's going to be more than a couple little alterations. Yeah, but uh, honestly, I, with the expansion draft looming because i think that would get announced close to the draft anyway um i think that probably during the stanley cup finals actually i think if that's the case then the asking price for all of those guys drops significantly because teams would rather keep their young guy versus their old guy and would rather get something than lose them for nothing Sure, yeah, with that caveat, I'll agree with you. I think if, if we have an expansion draft coming, it's very possible the Flames make a trade for those guys. Without that, I think the asking price is too high. Yeah, I, like I wouldn't give a late first-round pick or equivalent Flurry. player for no. any of those guys. Like I'd just si say, hey, Reimer, I'll give you an extra 500000 than you're worth. Mm -hmm. Just come with us. I, okay. think, I think Reimer's the you best know. choice of the UFAs. I still like Ranta. I think Ranta's been sold short for a lot of his career. I, I, I don't want to say he's the next Kippersoff because I don't think he'll be as good as Kippersoff, but I think he's like Kippersoff in the fact that he hasn't really been given a chance to really show what he can do. I agree. I don't think he's going to be the next Kipper, don't get me wrong, but I think that if you put him into a net like Calgary's, you're really going to see if this guy has any starting potential or if he's a career backup. Yeah. I can agree with you there. I just, so I'd, we're, it wouldn't be plan A or plan B if you're getting Ranta, but it just depends. But of the of the UFAs, the only ones I'd really want to target would be Reimer and Ranta. I think yeah, same here. Cam Ward is not the right guy for us. No. Um, Scrivens is not the right guy. No. Montoya is not the right guy. Like you know, Carter Hutton's been really inconsistent. Gustafson's not the right guy. Emery's not the right guy. Like I think if I'm targeting a UFA, it's Reimer or Ranta, and then I'd start looking on the trade market. Yeah, same here. Uh, like it would be different if the Flames didn't get the goaltending performances that they did from Ordeo. Like if we were shopping for both a starter and a backup, then some of those secondary names become attractive. But uh, with us only needing to fill one position, it's basically Reimer and then look on the trade market. And if the prices are too high still, then a guy like Ranta after that. Um, last question we'll debate before we wrap up the show this week. A lot of fans calling for Bob Hartley's head. We've talked about this before. Uh, Bob Hartley, you think he is behind the bench come season opener next year? 
I would assume so. Uh, I, the only coach that's out there that I could see being an upgrade would be Dave Tippett. And I know some people don't like that he, you know, because Arizona plays a very boring game that that wouldn't be exciting to watch, but the Flames have a lot more talent, just raw skill, than Arizona does. And, uh, like, it, that's one of the reasons why Arizona is always overperformed, is because of their quality, their, their defensive play. So, if the Flames could get him, then I think that would be an upgrade on Hartley. Other than that, no. To me, I think with Hartley having one really good season where he wins the the Jack Adams, one not so good year, you can't kind of throw the baby out with the bathwater. I think if you look at this team, it's not like everybody performed well and it was a coaching issue. I think we can probably all say there's other changes that need to be made first. I think the Flames could be quick to pull the trigger and remove him if they struggle out the gate next year. Yeah. Oh, same but, here. But, but I think that come... September and October when the season starts, Bob Hartley's the man going forward. Yeah. Well, like if you look I can at... see his I can see a supporting cast change and I think we might see some assistant coaches changing, but I think Hartley will be here. Yeah, same here. I think that like if you look at the lineup, how many of the players massively underperformed from where they were a year ago? Like there's only so much that you can blame on the coach. What, especially when half the team had career seasons and then the well, other half... Well, that to me is exactly why you can't count them. I mean, we had it's not like the whole team underperformed. No, it, it's not like uh, when Tortorella went to Vancouver and everybody's numbers dropped. And it's not like it was Goudreau and Monaghan and, you know, Giordano and Brody underperforming. Yeah, it was all the secondary players that were kind of on the bubble anyway that all fell off the face of the earth. Well... Not much you can do there. Uh, I, I think that Bob Hartley's an easy scapegoat for a lot of fans, and it's easy to call for his head, but I think that could be one of the worst things to do right now. And I think you bring him back in, you show team solidarity, but you have to be ready to pull that trigger next year if it, if it doesn't turn around. Exactly. Like, if the Flames make all the alterations that we were suggesting and they suck next year, then, yeah, you fire the coach and you get whomever is the best of what's available whether that's a guy like Randy Carlisle or somebody else who knows but you figure that out when you get there yeah you can't kind of speculate in advance and just fire your coach just because somebody good's come up you gotta you know give your coach the proper chances Matt when I think about this season and I sum it up in one sentence to me I think this season, we can say the Flames got what they deserved. The Flames didn't play good hockey for a lot of the year as a team. Yes, we had some guys that got career seasons, but as a team, this team didn't play good hockey. We got bad goaltending. We had a lot of underperformers. I think that based on what we did on the ice, not necessarily based on potential or where we expect them to be, but what we saw on the ice were exactly where we should be. Yeah, I agree. A anytime that you're getting that quality of defense and goaltending that's what you deserve really and it's not like the flames in the first month of the season fluked out into all those losses they deserved every single one of them and that was the season like if the flames start october at 500 they're playing hockey still but mm -hmm. they sucked legitimately and that's it so, yeah, they definitely deserved what they got. And they let go of a lot of games that they had in the late second, early third. It's like they got down in the game, and instead of trying to fight back, they just said, well, this one isn't ours. You know, we'll try the next one. And, you know, you can't just give up those kind of games. No, exactly. So I think overall to me, when I when I look at that season, that to me is the phrase that, sums it up for me is they got what they deserved yeah and it happens that every team has seasons where like everything goes wrong everything went right last year it balanced out this year now the flames have a 
great opportunity this off season to go shopping for to plug the handful of holes that they do have in the lineup and go from there. If anything, this season really did expose those holes so we know what we have to plug. Exactly. And that may be the best thing that comes out of this season is figuring out, okay, we need to fill three of the holes in the top nine, add in a, a defenseman, and we're good to go, and a goalie. So those can be addressed in a whole variety of ways. They just have to do it now, and that'll be fun for Brad for living. We'll see how things shake down this summer. This is our last podcast of the regular season, and we'll be back later. We'll post on Twitter and Facebook when we know exact dates, but we'll be back close to the draft as we start to do our usual draft previews, and we talk about the players the Flames may take in the first, second, third rounds, and then another we'll probably profile the later rounds. So look on social media, look on the website and our email list for that. We'll let you guys know the dates as we get closer. As always, when we get closer, Matt will also start to post the prospect profile so you can get a bit of an idea of who these guys are that the Flames might draft. Yeah, it, bef- it's hard to do it now when we don't know if the Flames are picking first, fifth, second, third, fifth, seventh, or eighth. I- expect that to come shortly after the lottery. Yeah, and we don't know if the Dallas Stars are going to make the conference finals and Chris Russell's going to play in 50% of the games in each round. So, well, at some point we're going to have to make some assumptions. But. Yeah, so th- that's why we're going to be leaving it until May-ish when the, all of that should be sorted out so that way we have a better idea of exactly what's going on <laughs> so that way we can know which picks to profile and all that kind of stuff. So, The last thing we do want to ask you guys, though, is uh, to take our listener survey. We did this last year and we're going to do it again this year. If you go to www.firesidechat.ca slash survey... There's a survey in there, and this really helps us to get to know who you guys are and what you want out of the show. Um, there's questions about, you know, how often do you listen? There's questions about the website. There's questions about how long you think the show should be. So giving us this information really helps us to make the show better. We take this feedback and we move forward with it to, you know, get a sense of who's listening, what people want, how we can improve the product. And we will, as we did last year, we'll put together a prize pack. So at the bottom of the survey, there's a place to put your name and email address. If you leave us your name and email address, you'll be entered into a, into a draw. And that draw will pick one person at random to win the prize pack. But you can't win if you don't leave your information. So if you just want to take the survey, don't want to leave the information, that's fine. But in order to win, you'll have to enter that information. So please take some time. We'll remind you again through social media take some time to take that survey it really helps matt and i out to know what you guys think and you know what your opinions are on the product yeah because at the end of the day we're doing this for you our listeners and readers on our web page so uh, the more information you give us the better we can adapt things to make it better for you so it's just helping yourself said- out The new Fireside Chat site that we launched this year was based on feedback from last year's survey, based on what people said they wanted or the information they wanted more or less of. So we reacted to that last year by building the brand new website. And, you know, we always want that. We want to move forward. So give us your thoughts. The survey doesn't take probably more than 15 minutes. Well, Matt, that wraps it up for 2015-2016. And uh, disappointing either way. But the Flames got what they deserved, and now they get to go golfing. Yeah, and there's plenty to look forward to in the off season. Uh, whether it'll depend largely on where we're drafting. Uh, if we luck out in one of the lottery positions, then our list of names becomes three long. And <laughs> if we're picking sixth, seventh, or eighth, then get a lot more options to choose from. So we'll just have to wait and see. Let's see how it all shakes out. We'll talk to you guys in just over a month. Yep. Thanks for listening, everyone. Have a good off-season, and we'll be back in a few weeks. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.